tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are documentarians Ross Kaufman and Zana Brisky, and author, actress, Marsha Wallace, who was a fixture, fixture along with Suzanne Plachette on The Bob Newhart Show. Filmmakers Ross Kaufman and Zana Brisky made a documentary about the children in the red light district of Calcutta, India. Zana gives the children cameras and teaches them photography. As a professional photographer, Zana ignites some of the sparks of creativity. Born into Brothels was the winner of over 20 major film festivals and went on to win the 2005 Academy Award for Best Documentary. Here's our interview with Ross Kaufman and Zana Brisky. First, you'll see a clip from Born into Brothels. your film. Thank you. Thank you. And we're here to talk about um, the documentary, Born Into Brothels. Uh, Zana, um, how did you get into this project? Did you have it in mind when yeah. you started? No, it was very karmic. I had none of this in mind when I started. I was in India photographing. I'm a photographer. Um, I ended up in Calcutta and somebody took me to the red light district and, uh, and that was it. That was the start. 
But why did you do this in Calcutta, other than the fact that you were already in India? Because there's so many brothels in so many other countries. But, yeah, I had no intention of photographing prostitution, but literally somebody took me, while I was in Calcutta, somebody took me to that specific red light district, and I was, I responded very viscerally to it. And since then, I've been to a lot of other red light districts, but I was particularly attracted to that one. Oh, because w were you, you were there on a project, right? You uh, were I, doing photographs? I was photographing on my own. I was doing my own work. Oh, but nothing to do with nothing to do with prostitution. Uh, uh, Ross, how did you get involved then? She was there working. And she was there working. She'd go <coughs> back and forth to Calcutta six months every year, and uh, at a certain point, she came back and said, "I really want to document the kids," and I don't know what that <coughs> means. Um, so she asked me if I wanted to make a film, and I said no. <laughs> well, then why did you get interested in the children? He's saying no, and you've got the kids going here. Well, I was originally interested in the women, and I was living in a brothel and photographing them. And there were children, many, many children in the brothels, who were curious about me and my camera. And I decided to teach them photography. And early on in that process, I was really amazed by the quality of their work and the liveliness of the children. And I just felt instinctively like I wanted to document what was going on and that at that point I asked Ross to come and make a film with me. Did Ross come and help the so-called cast? Did, did you have tried casting? Were you working in the casting part of it? I mean who chose the kids? Oh, you know, I had already been teaching the kids for a while. Oh you have? So it, it wasn't that we were uh, thinking about making a film. I was just documenting or I wanted to document what was already happening. And, and Zana basically said, I really want to document this in some way, shape, or form. She went out and bought two video cameras, one for me for my birthday, one for herself. And uh, she went and she shot four videotapes, sent them back to me in New York. I looked at them and I was in Calcutta three weeks later. I was just blown away by the footage. Is that right? Yeah. Because she came from a photographic background mm -hmm. and you came from a film editing background. Right. But when you got to Calcutta, how did you decide to separate all those uh, and share this project? It was funny because our shooting styles really complemented each other. Zana comes from a photography background where she's looking f at things from a really more of an aesthetic point of view. I come from an editing background. I'm looking at them from a story point of view, and those two styles really complemented each other well. Uh, well who wrote the story then? We didn't was, write a story. We, we went. This is a very, very organic process, and the film was in the style in which I take photographs, which is just to sit and wait and wait for, for life to happen. So nothing was written, nothing was set up, nothing was scripted, and there was no lighting, nothing fancy. It was just Ross and I with two video cameras being... Just, just reacting to what was happening but around Ross, us. But Ross, how did you edit it then? If it just... I mean, how did you know where to stop? It could have been ten it, hours long. It took a long time to edit <coughs> the film. We edited the film for about a year. We had 170 hours of footage. Um, we got every minute of it translated. and. Um, it's just a matter of really going through the footage and, and feeling the material and developing a film from that. I think we instinctively knew when to stop, when the story was over and it had reached, I mean the whole project had reached an, a natural climax. But then did you finish there? Did you leave Calcutta? I'm very involved uh, with the children. I've started an organization called Kids with Cameras to help the children. Um, and we're also <coughs> planning to build a school of leadership in the arts specifically for children of prostitutes which will open in 2006. Oh, good. So while I'm not taking photographs there anymore, um, I'm very much involved in the lives of the children and the women. Ross, you were really with the camera all the time. How did they react to you behind that camera? Uh, they were they were great. I mean, Zan and I both shot the film, and they just, they loved taking pictures. They didn't mind being in front of the camera. They were just kids, and that they was the beauty They were interacting with her, right. but you, were you giving directions? No, we just, <laughs> you know, we never give directions. That's the funny thing. We just shoot what's in front of us. It's uh, more of a verite really, style. Really yeah. pure documentary. Nothing was set up, nothing was manipulated. Totally guerrilla, kind of, right? Basically, yeah. But, uh, some, of, some of those films that I noticed, some was really clear and some was a bit grainy. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know in the, the beginning with that red, if you did that just to make it the red light district. Or, does it really look like that? Uh, that's yeah, how, pretty that's much. how we shot it. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Manipulate anything. It's a very, very rich, rich, vibrant place. When, while I was you know, watching, and I've been to India, and I know I've been in situations where I've been a little bit hesitant about moving around, were you ever afraid, either one of you? Often. 
Oh, we're afraid. What kind of si situations uh, uh, were frightening? Well, it's a very dangerous place. Cameras are totally taboo there. And, you know, to give kids oh. cameras is a very dangerous thing. The red light district was a very dangerous place. Um, I was often threatened and followed. And the That's women, what I wondered. Women were very protective of me. And it was also dangerous for the kids to be there with cameras. Did you wear just your jeans I just wore and jeans, jeans and t-shirts. I didn't Did pretend to be Indian. I didn't, you know, I wanted to be there. I was there as a photographer. Did you feel the impact of your teaching on the whole community? Because you were teaching the kids, you said. Absolutely. I mean, the lives of the, tran of, of the children were really transformed through learning photography. Um, they're, <coughs> they're taught to be very ashamed of who they are. They're very stigmatized. Oh. Um, they, their self-confidence really grew through taking pictures, talking about their pictures, showing their pictures to the outside world. Um, and, of course, that affected their communities as well, th their mothers. Well, you, you said you taught them how to edit. How do you teach them how to edit? I mean, is it just their natural eye, or were you really discussing film and shoot with something in the background and things like that? I was only teaching them still photography, not, not uh, video. Um, <coughs> and every week they would shoot film. I would get it developed. We would uh, produce contact sheets. And they would talk about, they would pick their, the photographs that they liked and explain why they liked them. And other kids would do the same thing. So it would be a, a class discussion about what makes a good photo, or why they like certain photos. And then we'd print up the photos and again have that discussion. One of the things that really stood out in my mind is because I heard the Zerna and I heard the drums. Who picked the music? The music was fabulous. Well, we had a composer, his name is John McDowell, and he worked only for three weeks on the score, and he did an incredible job. Um, we all worked together in trying to create a feeling of what it was like in the red light district. A lot of that kind of music you hear in the red light district, and that's you what we're going for. That's Absolutely, you hear a lot of Bollywood um, and a lot of devotional, uh, devotional music. So well, it was really melancholy, and then like tambourines or something. Mm -hmm. I thought was like ready to go. Yeah, yeah. it's very or uh, organic to the the sounds that you hear in the brothel. Well, I know you're going to set up a nonprofit organization for children with. Cameras, is that what it's called? Kids with cameras. Kids with cameras. Kids with cameras. It's, a, it's an organization. It's already been uh, running for two years, and it's to empower children through photography. I think it's great. Thanks for being with us today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm with Emmy Award winning actress, Marsha Wallace, who was born and raised in Iowa. After Parsons College, she went to New York to study acting with Uta Hagen. So, is it true you weighed three, 230 oh, yeah, pounds? Oh, please. You can see my <laughs> eating disorders across the television screen the last 30 years. How hard was it for you to go into acting school then? I was, I had more guts than brains, you know. Really? But, yeah. and, and you were working off Broadway at that time? I went to New York City the day I graduated from college. So you wanted to be an actress? I wanted to be an actress. Um, I weighed 230 pounds, had $150 in the bank, and I tell theatrical hopefuls their ready cash should at least equal their weight. <laughs> You and didn't have enough. <laughs> now I have a son, an 18-year-old son who wants to be an actor. I said, fine, act like you like me. Uh, That's what, the challenge. How did you get into off-Broadway plays? Just because of Uta Hagen and the Howard Berghoff studio? Well, I went to uh, study. My dream was to study with Uta Hagen. Mm -hmm. I went. I auditioned for Uta Hagen. She said, thanks, but no thanks. So I thought, well, now what do I do? What's my next dream? Well, I, and then I figured, well, I'm here. So I went down and I signed up with a guy named Bill Hickey, who's William oh, Hickey, yeah. who went on, who was in Pritzi's Honor and everything. He was looking for a place to eat and drink in the middle of the night, and so um, he started an improv group at a place called Hilly's, next to Trudy Heller's, which isn't there anymore. Yeah, yeah, the, the dance, the disco. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
so out of that, somebody came in out of the rain one night from the Merv Griffin <clears> show, <throat> and oh. I ended up there. So it's interesting, if my dream had happened when I got there, and it if wouldn't I have happened. It, it might not have <laughs> happened. So uh, a couple years later, I went back and auditioned for Uda again. And she said, okay, this time. Oh, well, now that you were with well, Merv I think Griffin. She, I, was, I was a little, uh, I need some seasoning, you some experience, some technique. So was Merv Griffin your big break? Merv Griffin discovered me, yeah. I mean, I don't, know if I'm, I don't know if I'm on his resume. Did you stay? Up there with uh, <laughs> Lily Tomlin and the Biggies, but he, uh, he discovered me. And I did 75 appearances on Merv Griffin. Oh, you d were you all working together? What kind of appearances were you doing? Well, those, there was very little stand-up in I those I was going to say. It was more sit-down. <laughs> but were you a comic? Um, I, in terms of stand-up, I was never in the right place at the right time. When I was starting out, um, there was Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller. And you couldn't get back into acting. Now oh. they give the busboy the laugh store right. uh, his own series. So right. people go back and forth into, into the, the mediums. But in those days, and I liked, so I got into this, uh, the improv group instead, which is like working with people and uh -huh. no fourth wall, so. But no, uh, Merv Griffin was working in New York at he, the time. Yeah, he then was on forever and he had uh, his syndicated <coughs> After, you know, usually ran in the afternoon. And then what brought you to Los Angeles? Merv Griffin. He brought Hello. you here too? He had a nighttime show opposite Carson for about 20 minutes. No, actually it was a year and a half. <laughs> Merv, sorry. A year and a half. We love Merv. I love Merv <laughs> on CBS. And uh, Oh, so that's when so you So I came? came out. And it was one of those days where I thought I'd, I'd audition for some, you know, galoshes commercial that was going to run in the middle of the night in Butte, Montana, and I thought, I, I don't think I, I'm cut out for this. And I had done Merv's uh, show, and Bill Paley, who was running CBS at the time, saw me and said, put her on the Bob Newhart show. That's how it happened? That's how it happened. Bill Paley, he was really brilliant, wasn't oh, he? Hello. Brilliant for you. Brilliant for me. <laughs> and. Uh, I never met him, and I just always wanted to just so he make just a fool of myself thanking him. But He'd just seen you on the show. And he didn't, there were things about the pilot he didn't like, and so he said, get that guy from I Dream of Jeannie, Bill Daly. Oh. And I saw this girl on the Bob Newhart show. And I was on there with a whole bunch of starlets, very beautiful. So I stood out. I was not like everybody so else. So when you went on the Bob Newhart show, it looked like one big family. You, you kind of pushed everyone around, though, didn't you? Well, for being I in that role. It was a great gig, and it was, um, you know, what I loved about it, it was not one of those, um, I'm desperate for a man, I'll take them if they're breathing kind of character. Yeah. Carol, Carol was, Carol got around. Everyone She ran off you. with the, uh, she <laughs> ran off with the dentist. She ran, had a fling with the, she went to Canton, Ohio with, with Howard the pilot. Did you help him write any of this? No. <laughs> but you, you did, did whatever they told you. <laughs> Please. We had brilliant writers. And uh, Bob, you know, the persona of Bob Newhart, you can't go wrong with that. When, when, were but they all getting along together? We all got along together. Isn't that, that's so great, because you hear horror stories about these, well, these sitcoms. Well, um, there are two things you can do, you know, a good sitcom is good writing and good chemistry, and one you can do something about, and one you can't. Right. One you just get lucky, and we got lucky. And to this day, are you still friends? Yeah. Yes! <laughs> you know, Suzanne married Tom Poston. And, and he was? He, he was uh, on Bob's second show, but he also he played the peeper on our show. <laughs> he did so. And it's a wonderful story because they had been, they had been together as, as, you know, in their 20s and went on to get married and their spouses died and they got together and they're madly in love. It's so great. Isn't that great? Well, so you have a really wonderful story, too, that you're telling in this book that you wrote, Don't Look Back. Well, we're not going that way. We're not going that way. It's so brilliant. We don't want to oh, go I, backwards, do we? Well, I, there wouldn't be much of a book if I didn't look back, <laughs> but you look back for a minute and then you move forward. Right. My dad used to say this, don't look back, we're not going that way. Of course, he also said, oh. if I don't see you again, the mule is yours. So not everything he said was deep. I got it. But <laughs> he, he's, um, he died in 86, but oh, believe me, he'd be thrilled. He'd be selling this in his sundry store. But you uh, have such a positive, upbeat outlook because you came upon a lot of obstacles yeah. in your, your well, life. Well, what's the subtitle? How I Managed to Overcome a Rocky Childhood, a Nervous Breakdown, Breast Cancer, Widowhood, Fire, Menopausal, Motherhood, and still managed to count my lucky chickens. And you still got it all on there. I know, I did, I did. So I wanted to talk about 
your rocky child. I'll, I'll talk about all these. Rocky childhood. Well, you know, it's more a story of, of a decade. Um, I grew up in the 50s and nobody talked about anything personal. So I look back now and no wonder nobody was happy to see me. It's like, oh God, here she comes. She's going to want to talk personal. Uh. And I had, my father was a man with uh, big dreams, and terrible luck, and no impulse control. Mm. Um, but nobody talked about anything that was going on. So you didn't it. know it. You didn't I didn't know. know. <laughs> you I didn't know how bad it was. I, I didn't know. And it's made me, you know, who I am. I think that's what happens. Everything that, that you've gone through just makes these layers in you and usually makes you for the better if, you, if you're a positive person. Well, I certainly got my uh, optimism from my dad and uh, he, when he was 70, he decided he wanted to be a real estate mogul and he took the test and he flunked it 13 times. Oh, and he kept going? And he kept going. He said, don't look back. We're not going that way. So thus, don't, I filed that away. Don't think I didn't. I filed that away. So you had a nervous breakdown. I did. I had a nervous breakdown. Now, During please, when? Uh, the second year of the Bob Newhart Show. Really? And, and they I, kept you on because you were on for a long I time. I was very lucky. I was very lucky. Cause they, they liked me, but they made it pretty clear that I needed to get some help. Please, today, if it happened, I'd be on The View with the Olsen twins. <laughs> Maybe you'd be bigger, right? I mean, please. But in those days, they didn't talk about... Again, my, my, uh, my rhythm was a little off because they didn't um, yeah. talk about those... You know, and stuff, breast you know. cancer, they didn't talk... Uh, first of everything. all, I just kind of unraveled, and it could happen to anybody. You mean for the nervous breakdown? Uh -huh. And I got some help, and uh, You mean and just forward. too much work? Well, my best friend, Brett Summers, remember from the match game? She, that's when I lost 100 pounds, oh. much of which I put back on when my husband died. But um, at that time, a lot of stuff came up, you know. And uh, I was starting to deal with things I'd never dealt with, and I just sort of unraveled. It could happen. Yeah. And then I went on. I did. But I maybe they wouldn't call it a nervous breakdown today. I like to think of it as a nervous breakthrough. <laughs> breakthrough. Because I think if you're getting help and you're, you're breaking through, you're I unraveling. Did. I needed to get some help. And yeah. it, I was never embarrassed about it. And so then I we went on to meet the man of my dreams. So then you were widowed. Yeah, well, first I... <laughs> First, I had to meet him. That's what I mean. I mean, you discuss <laughs> oh, all of these, right? I love my <laughs> darling Dennis. And I met him. Uh, I was 41. He was 39. And the great thing about meeting Mr. Wright in your middle years, you don't have to worry about him going through a midlife crisis because you're it. That's great. You're yeah, it. That's exactly right. And he asked me to marry him. And three days later, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh, that's how that came about? Yeah. Ah, so... So he was with me every step of the way, and I have become an advocate for breast cancer awareness, you know, mammograms, breast self-exams, yearly doctor exams, and gut instinct. I had a feeling something was up, which is what Did got me you? to the doctor. And uh, one of my cancer doctors was Monica Lewinsky's father. Oh, is yeah. Because he was... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Clinton's girlfriend's father has seen my breast. Thank you. <laughs> they say there's, you know, six <laughs> degrees of separation. Then we've got it, there's don't we? There's only three between my breast and Bill. Oh, that happens. <laughs> And then I, I was able to, he helped me, and then when he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. That was terrible. Six years after we got married. Right away. But he said something, uh, you know, two weeks before he died that was like a metaphor for our life together, Joan. He said, I'm so glad we used our good china. Oh, I read yeah. that in the book. That was very touching. We d we because we put everything away, Put everything we? off, and we, we went to Paris, and we traveled, and... We adopted a fabulous boy, and we used our good china. Most of it's broken, but so what? We had some fabulous exactly. meals. Exactly. So you, you discussed those problems in yeah. the book. You talk about your widowhood. I do. The other thing, f fat we know, you call it fat and fire. What is that? Well, f my house burned down. Oh, they're, they're not together. There's a real a fat fire. There's a comma. You mean yeah. a real fire? A real fire. A oh, real fire. Wow. This was oh, after yeah. Denny died, and then Mikey and I were coming home from the movies, and I said, oh, Mikey, look, there's a... There's a fire in our street. Oh, Mikey, look, there's a fire in our block. Oh, Mikey, look. Oh, no. There's a fi it's our house. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, before we got to Mikey, you had a lot of trouble conceiving. I and did. Be becoming a mother, you really, both of you wanted to be parents. Uh, we decided we wanted to be parents more than we wanted to have a baby. <laughs> we did. <laughs> so right. we adopted. It was more important. It right? was more important. I, I am in awe of people who play that fertility game and it goes on for oh, years. I know. Must put a terrible 
uh, it, pressure on your it's, marriage. It's difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. But so you were lucky you had Mikey. Had Mikey and uh, we were a little long in the tooth to be parents. You know, we were the only parents at Toys R Us with reading glasses. <laughs> But it's, it, you know, I was a family, we were a family, and I was just wildly happy. And so that was fabulous. And then you went on to be an uh, Emmy Award winner. I, were you working all the time, Marsha? Pretty much. Um, Through all this? You know, when it all hit the fan, it really hit the fan. I mean, Denny lost his job, and or his job ended. It was during, you know, uh, nobody was traveling. He was a hotel general manager. Uh, oh, right. And he... Uh, so then he got sick, and then our savings went. A anyway, it all. So when he died, I, my house was in foreclosure, and I had a ton of. But I, you know, you I'm, I'm a plucky Midwestern gal. You really and were. I pulled myself up and, and my and extra poundage, and I moved <laughs> forward. And I hope I've. I hope my son remembers that. You, you know? did voiceover. Oh, well, so I'm on The Simpsons. In fact, tomorrow I'm recording the Simpsons movie. So that's how you got your Emmy Award. Yes, as the, uh, ha you know, unlucky in love, Mrs. Krabappel. And before we ah! go, um, before we go, I just want to know how you had the nerve to write this book and tell everything. Well, that's what people say to me. It's so honest, they say. But what, why do it if you're not? I don't, it doesn't seem like any big deal. It never occurred to me to not tell the truth. Why would you want to write a book and not tell the truth? Not that it's it's and like, I don't spare myself. No, you don't spare mm -hmm. yourself. But it it's inspirational. Oh, I hope so. Because ultimately, it's about I'm not the only person in the world that ever struggled in a relationship with her mother. Oh, <laughs> we didn't even talk about no, that. No, I know. But but the important thing is we we had reconciliation and forgiveness before she died, and uh, you know I just feel I've had a wonderful wonderful life, and it's not over yet. Oh, that's so great. Oh, Marcia, thank you so thank much you, for being with us today. And I have my own website, you know, MarciaWellness.com. Oh, we do. Well, well, that's where I found out everything about that's you. That's right. <laughs> and thank you for watching today. The Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. We'll see you next time.